Liberty Media's Charm Offensive. I am your host, Tiffany Madison, and this interview can be found at Liberty Media's YouTube channel and on my publishing site, tiffanymadison.liberty.me. Today we are speaking with Professor Andrew Fife, an Iraq War veteran that served during the Iraq invasion and in Fallujah during the first years of the war. Professor Fife is a Bronze Star recipient and is now currently a doctoral student. You can find his work, work at atfife.com. Welcome, Professor Fife. Thank you for coming with us today. Thanks for letting me be here. I know we both have really busy schedules. It's been about a week of us trying to work the time out to do this, so I'm glad we're finally able to uh, talk. I agree. I agree. Thank you for taking the time. I know you've been traveling a lot, so uh, we all appreciate you uh, sharing your insights with us. Um, so before I pick your brain on some philosophical and moral questions, which they're definitely coming, uh, let's okay. discuss the situation in Iraq. Um, can you briefly share with the Liberty Me audience what exactly is going on in Iraq and why Americans should be concerned? That's a big nest of issues, but uh, I'll try to summarize. Um, so Saddam was a Sunni minority, and he ruled over Iraq. And when we came and replaced uh, Saddam's government with a democracy, the Shia, who are the majority there, um, they won the elections. Uh, unfortunately, they have an axe to grind against the Sunnis, and they have no interest in ruling in a post-partisan way, in a, in a non-sectarian way. So. Um, there's been the western Iraq and northern northwest Iraq, where the Sunnis are, who have been disempowered, disempowered by our invasion. Um, they've become um, de they've they've lost faith in that central government. Although I, I don't know how much they had faith in that government in the first place, um, and they're just ripe for fighting a civil war. They they were ISIS didn't have any trouble taking over western Iraq and northwestern Iraq because those populaces hate the central Shia government. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I mean, ISIS obviously are uh, at least moderately good fighters. I don't think they would stand a chance up against us. But the reason they're having such an easy time in Iraq is because they're taking over areas that are already uh, dis, uh, disillusioned, that's the word I keep looking for, disillusioned with the central Shia government. Now, maybe those Sunni areas will fight ISIS themselves and throw them away once they've freed themselves from the central government in Iraq, but uh, ISIS is a pretty nasty group. Uh, I, can, I can't imagine that anybody wants, uh, wants to be ruled over that, that by that organization, even the, the Sunnis. The only reason those areas are siding with ISIS is because of their hate with, for the central government, the justified hate of the central government in Baghdad. Yeah, that's, that's a spot on analysis, and sadly it is justified. Uh, the puppet installation that we you know, erected there in typical fashion um, has done what it always does and, and oppressed the minority and, and even parts of the majority of, the, of other regions of the country, and now we're in the situation that we're in. Um, as you said, ISIS has taken Fallujah. Um, for those unfamiliar with the legacy of the Iraq War, the battles of Fallujah 1 and 2 are some of the most bloody American conflicts that have been fought since the Vietnam era. Um, you know, you were in Fallujah, and you obviously know the toll on the American civilian, or on the Iraqi civilians, and on um, American forces, as well as some coalition partners as well, both from the Marines and the Army. How do you think that OIF veterans feel um, seeing hard-won cities like Fallujah and even Ramadi falling into extremist hands? Uh, I mean, it's. I, I'm, I know this is trite, but it's heartbreaking. Uh, it's it's really disheartening to have. Uh, those cities fall. Um, I mean, I don't have you know any particular love for Fallujah, but I know I you know I fought there. I, there's a lot of lives that have been lost there. Uh, it's just sad to uh, devote yourself and have so many veterans devote themselves to trying to make that a better place and to see it descend back into chaos uh, after we left. I, I know that uh, a lot of people don't want, and maybe it's international interest not to get involved in Iraq again, but on a personal level, I want to go back. You know, I want to, I, I hate to see, uh, I hate to see these, the, the, the hard-won victories uh, fall apart, and uh, I hate to leave a job unfinished. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. Yeah, you're you're not alone in that sentiment. Um, I think a lot of a lot of people who serve there feel that way, and um, it is very frustrating. Uh, that kind of goes into my next question. And in your view, if the Kurds hold the north and defend Kirkuk and Baghdad remains strong, assuming ISIS then you know continues occupying the remainder of the country, 
do we then have a three-state solution by proxy, or do you think that's an untenable time bomb? Well, I love the Kurds. Uh, in my time there, they seem to be the only ones not trying to kill us. And uh, uh, I mean, um, so I, I'm I'm happy for their their uh, their being put in a better position by all this. Although, I mean, this is a terrible situation, but I think one uh, upside is that the the Kurds might finally get what they want. Um, their independence will cause some trouble because they also want the southern tip of Turkey, and Turkey's also our ally. But I think that that might work itself out. Um, the problem with the three-state solution is that you have oil in the north and you have oil in the south. So the Shias in the south will have oil. Uh, the Kurds hopefully will get the oil in the north, and then the Sunnis, which would be the third part of that uh, tripart country, uh, wouldn't have anything. Right? The western Iraq and northwest Iraq, where the Sunnis are, they just—it's a desolate area. There's not a lot going on there. So the problem with the three-state solution was always that if we divide the country three ways, there's not three areas with resources. There's two areas with resources. Um, there's a question of which country would get Baghdad, and then there'd be a question of who gets those oil fields in the north. Um, but we might end up with it. We might end up with, with a, 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 a three countries here, with Kurdistan in the north, with a, a Iraq, I assume they'd hold on to that name, for Baghdad in the south with the Shias. Uh, and then the Sunnis would get their own country, but it's it's that's a hard country to form given that they have no resources. And there's constantly going to be fights over those borders trying to push them a little further out, particularly over those oil fields in the north because those Sunnis are going to be desperate to hold those areas. And the Shias are going to want to hold on to those oil fields in the north too. So, I mean, we'll see where the, that's really the point of, I mean, Baghdad is, is a point of contention. I don't think that the Shia are going to lose that. I think that's always going to be a part, under Shia control now. But those oil fields in the north, if, if we end up with three countries there, uh, who's going to get those seems to be uh, the question that's going to um, be with us for a while now. Yeah, uh, how this actually turns out is uh, a question for the ages. Um, undoubtedly, it is an extremely volatile area, and there's so many different factions and factors that go into whether or not this will um, turn into something that you know should have existed 10 years ago or dissolve into an even worse disaster. Um, moving on to some philosophical questions, I kind of want to pick your brain, uh, given your okay. kind of study. That's more uh, my area. Yeah, and the majority of uh, the viewers that are members of the Liberty Me community are um, you know, very liberty-minded, they love politics and philosophy, so uh, I'm sure this will be right up their alley. Um, you know, many veterans feel that the Iraq War has kind of become our generation's Vietnam. The secrecy, the futility, uh, nation building, you know, that, that legacy, make, you know, using those different uh, delineating factors doesn't really make their comparison too far-fetched. Um, do you agree with the war in Iraq is akin to the war in Vietnam? And if so, what does that say about Obama's decision to send special forces in to protect our embassy at this hour uh, as the country disintegrates into factional violence? Um. So there are many parallels with Vietnam. I don't know about a broad comparison with Vietnam. There's so many different points. Um, I, I, I was, a, I guess I was a supporter, or not a supporter, but I was at least open to the possibility of invading Iraq in the first place when I thought, you know, I was lied to and told there were weapons of mass destruction being developed there. I, I, I guess um, I don't, there obviously were not. Right. That's that's a big uh, project, of military militarizing large scale weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons. Uh, there's just no way that those could have been hide it, hid in the desert or spirited away. Um, they just weren't there, and so um, it's too too bad that we were led to war under mistaken or false pretenses. Um, the, the worst part was that once we were there, there was no plan. I mean, I spent the first year of the war in Iraq. Uh, basically enforcing an anarchy where uh, no one could take control, but we weren't really ruling the country either. So you, it's. I think when we first showed up, the Iraqis were like, okay, you're in control. What are you going to do now, Americans? And we said, we're not in control. You guys should run your own country. And it's really, it was a, things could have gone a lot better had the Bush administration and Cheney and Rumsfeld had a plan for what to do in that country after we had taken Baghdad. Um, Things turned around a bit with Petraeus. I think he uh, he really knew what he was doing. Um, he was the sort of uh, outsider at the time, making all the sorts of complaints that anybody who was there was also making, um, that we needed to, if we were going to stay, we had to provide security in the, in, in the country and, and uh, try 
try winning the populace over by reconstructing and ruling uh, as opposed to just letting um, bandits, criminals, gangs uh, uh, run that country. Um, and also, Petraeus was willing to take the casualties required to do that. Uh, for a long time, the Bush administration, I think, was trying to keep the casualties down and as a, as a result was unwilling to do the work that was necessary. Um, so anyway, the, the, the Iraq war, I think, was a mistake, right? We shouldn't have gone in. What, what compounded that mistake is that we didn't have any idea, or the, the upper leadership didn't have any idea what they wanted to do with Iraq once they got it. Um, as, na as far as now, uh, you know, Obama seems to be trying to keep us out for the most part, right? You have McCain and Lindsey Graham, uh, a lot of saber rattling uh, from the same people who got us involved. Um, I, I don't know, Obama seems to be somebody who's a little bit, he's not uh, as principally against interventional, interventionism as a libertarian would, right? A libertarian thinks that you know, we have no business to, using tax dollars or being involved to go around the world or be involved in other countries' uh, uh, problems. Uh, obviously, Barack Obama doesn't agree with that. He seems to think that we do have a place in doing that, but he's at least pragmatic about it, and he doesn't seem like he's going to go get involved just for the sake of getting involved. He's He hasn't done airstrikes yet. He doesn't seem to be inclined to put... Uh, troops on the ground, although except for these advisors, there's always a worry that that's going to expand, um, and particularly if, you know, Baghdad falls. I always think that we tend to put military in places like South Korea so that if North Korea invades, we immediately take casualties, and then we have a justification for going to war. So anytime the U.S. government puts military forces somewhere, it's there's a question about whether they're doing it purposely to put them in danger so that then you have a justification for start, uh, fighting back if if they if they get attacked. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I think it's a wait and see for what Barack Obama is going to do. Um, I he is like I said, he's not principally against getting involved, but I, he doesn't seem to be as uh, I, ideologically driven to war as uh, some of the other politicians we have in our uh, government. Yeah, I would agree with you. In fact, that may be the only, and I mean only, thing that I agree with him on. Um, I've, you know, waged ideological war with fellow conservatives, um, many of which who profess to be Christian, which are, um, you know, the Prince of Peace. They should be following his um, ideology instead of the war hawks and chicken hawks in Washington. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's probably the only thing I, I defend him on. Um, and, and, you know, getting back to what you had said about Iraq and not having a plan, I am appalled that the policy architects and the Washingtonians that, um, you know, with their arrogance and conceit went in without a plan, the Paul Brimmers disbanding the Iraqi army, I mean, uh, having us pull back from Fallujah and then setting, you know, our weapons and our these, these trained forces loose, which immediately fell, and then having to go back in and, and having, you know, casualties again. Um, all of those people should be in prison, in my opinion. Um, so, but I have a, a question for you in terms of almost exactly what you just said, um, and this is uh, getting to the, the philosophical question there. Um, there is a long-standing tradition in Western culture, uh, just war theory, and most of the people who are watching this are probably familiar with it, um, and you can answer this quickly, but um, do you think that, would you summarize the Iraq war as a just war in accordance with those guidelines? I think I know your answer now. Um, but, you know, is that something that, and is there any justification that we can make at all for any of, of the things that we did there? Well, I guess you have to sort of uh, look at it as, in terms of justifying, it seems like there's three phases you'd have to justify. You'd have to justify the, the initial invasion, and then the question is, once we were there, was a staying justified? And then I guess this third phase, if, if we're justified in going back or continuing to be involved. Um, any war that's begun on a complete mistake is an illegitimate war. Um, so I think that the first phase is, I, and, I, and I don't, you know, even if it was false intelligence or mistakes or an honest, I don't, I don't, I, I'm unwilling to say it's a completely honest mistake, right? It's at least a lot of willful ignorance and uh, not ne negligence, right? So I think that there's some culpable negligence at the least for that first phase. Um, the second phase, after the invasion, um, I mean, what? The, I think that's a tough question. Once you've invaded a country on, on a mistake and taken out the central government, how much do you owe that populace to try to make up for that fact? 
Um, so I don't, I, I, I'm not sure what to say about whether we should have stayed or how long we should have stayed or whether it was justified for us to continue to spend American taxpayers staying, whether we had any um, obligation to Iraq given the Bush administration's mistake invading it in the first place. So I think the second, that, that second question is really tough. Um, as far as getting involved now, I, the only justification, I think, is on humanitarian grounds, right? If you, if you believe in humanitarian interventions, if you think that ISIS is going to, you know, violently oppress uh, parts of Iraq, then maybe you can make some sort of argument. But I don't think that, uh, I don't think you're, uh, the, uh, I don't think a libertarian would accept that as, as justified. Um, so uh, it sort of depends on whether you, know, uh, you think that uh, we're right to send the U.S. military to go just stop random violence in the world. Um, but, you know, the thing about ISIS is uh, right now it seems like we should just wait and see how it goes just because the, the Sunnis in the West, I think they, there's a good chance that they might get rid of ISIS once, uh, once ISIS has fought the central government and broke Western Iraq away from the central government. There's a good chance that the uh, Shias, they haven't really launched their counterattack yet. They might be able to do this on their own. Uh, we don't want to just go in and be Maliki's air force for him, right? We don't want, he, we don't want to just enforce this, the continuation of this Shia uh, dominance over Iraq. So right now I think that not even whether it's justified, just on practical terms, it seems like this is not the time to start fighting. It's, it's, I think we need to wait and see. We, need, we would at least need Maliki to you know, realize that he needs to rule this country, hopefully step down. I, at the very least, our in, involvement on a practical level would have to be contingent on that central government making significant um, changes in the way that they're treating the Sunnis. Um, but I think that there's a good chance, even if this breaks up into three different countries, I mean, it might break up into three different countries, and maybe it's not in our interest to have ISIS ruling over that area, but I don't think that ISIS is here to stay. I think this is, this is going to, right now, it's, I think, our best, uh, our be the best thing for us to do is to keep an eye on it. Um, I agree. And, yeah, I agree. It's funny. I was reading, um, it's not funny, actually, it's terrible, but I was reading through uh, some BBC reports that they're now threatening Jordan. So it seems like this very militant force is, you know, just kind of hell-bent on challenging whatever ruling authority exists in any place that they kind of want to spread their ideology to. So, yeah, holding and actually forming a, a you know, even like a, a Taliban-like tribal um, enforcement of Sharia law or, or whatever it is that they're seeking to enforce on the local population is highly suspect. Um, it also reminds me of, you know, the Ambar Awakening and how, you know, subjected to the brutality of you know these these foreign fighters and these radicals, the local population actually rose up and sided yes. with the Americans, the lesser of two evils, because they were tired of being subjected to that. And you see almost the same thing happening in Syria as well. So it's it's very it's very interesting that um, you've got these you know very militant, uh, hyper radical Islamist groups trying to impose their way of life on you know fairly modernized or or uh, moderate people that don't want to live under that uh, radical rule of thumb. So it is a, a hot you know, contest to see who is actually going to you know, rule that area. Um, I have one last question for you. All right. Um, so, and this is more um, of a kind of a uh, philosophical, but kind of a moral question as well. Um, so I was a, used to be a, a crisis counselor, actually, with veterans. And um, so I have a, a soft spot. I'm a daughter of a veteran. I'm married to a veteran. And a lot of my friends are um, you know, current active duty or uh, retired veterans as well. Um, so I've, I've worked in that advocacy for a very long time, and so I have a different perspective, I think, than most libertarians, and when I'm trying to communicate with them, um, I always, since they're very staunchly anti-war, and so am I, um, I always get this, this same rebuttal, and um, when debating the legacy of the Iraq War, anti-war activists basically inform me, or inform others as well, that anyone who served in Iraq, since it was an unjust war, does not deserve to have their service, their sacrifice, respected, or even valued. In fact, they should be shunned so that future generations are not manipulated the same way that they were. Um, a lot of you know these activists have a great heart, and they really, really do mean the best. Um, but approaching veterans, particularly since so many of them are liberty-minded with such an antagonistic and almost heartless approach to their sacrifices, to me, is not an effective way to spread uh, libertarian ideals amongst uh, constitutionalists and formerly extremely conservative veterans, especially if we want to recruit them to the liberty uh, sphere. 
What do you say to critics of the Iraq War that are incapable of separating the soldier from the war? I mean, to tell you the truth, I don't think I have anything to say to them. Um, and uh, definitely, it, it, it'd be a series of expletives if I did. Uh, I've, I've haven't, I haven't met many people who who, who have, have been that way. Maybe people who keep it to themselves, but I, I have. I, I, in, in, it's, I've been back for. 10, 11 years, and so I have run into a handful of people who, who take that attitude, and um, I mean, it's just, it's just really angering in a, in a very chest bump, like a fiery, fire in your chest kind of way, and, and uh, I, don't, I don't really know what to say, it's just sort of, I'm sort of dumbfounded by the, angered and dumbfounded, and, but so angered that I don't even know what to say, so it's, that's, it's a really offensive attitude to take, at least, and uh, I'm probably too personally involved to be able to have any sort of objective perspective on it. I completely understand where you're coming from. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Professor Fife, and uh, we really value your time and insights. Great. I, I appreciate uh, you having me on here. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Well, you can read more of Professor Fife's work at his website, and you can find the transcript to this interview on my publishing site, tiffanymadison.liberty.me. Please like, share, and subscribe.